Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining the Lee Kong Tian Research Fellowship sharing session. We are honored to have all of you here and hope that you will have an enjoyable evening with us. I'm Timothy Pui, Senior Librarian with the Singapore Southeast Asian Collection. In this evening's talk, we have Benjamin Ku, who holds a Master's in Colonial and Global History from Leiden University. He has worked on the volume Studying Singapore Before 1800. The past few months, he has been looking at the pre-1819 European literature in Singapore and Southeast Asia, looking at how Singapore was viewed at by Europeans then, and understanding their mental image of Singapore. I will now pass the session on to Benjamin. Thank you. Thanks, Timothy, for the introduction. Please give me a few minutes so I set up my slides. Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. It's a pleasure for me to share with you a little bit about my research on the circulation of knowledge of Singapore between 1500 and 1800. So before I begin, let me just take the opportunity to thank the NLB for organizing the sharing and of course this wonderful fellowship. I'd like to thank the librarians, my research assistant, Mr. Timothy Pui, the people at the special collections, Joanna Tan, and Dr. Peter Boschberg and Mr. Kwa Chong Guan for their feedback, advice, and general assistance throughout the course of this research. And of course, everyone who is attending today, wherever you are, thanks so much for taking the time out on a Friday, no less, to listen to our presentations. So without further ado, let me start with a quote from Sir Frank Sweetenham, who was one of the former uh, governors of the Straits Settlement. So this is what he actually says in one of his books. So what is strange is that in those 600 years, there should have been no Portuguese, no Hollander, no Englishman with curiosity and application enough to make himself acquainted with the ancient history of Singapore. So what Sweetenham is claiming here is that there was knowledge about Singapore. It's just that people didn't bother to find out about it. So I want to take up Sweetenham's claim here with a series of questions. So first, is this true? And if this is not true, you know, what the people, especially in Europe, know about Singapore between 1500 and 1800? And third, how did this knowledge circulate? So my presentation today is divided into three parts. First, I want to give you a sense into the numbers, uh, into the number of references that we can find of Singapore be before 1800. And of course, this really is focused on references that can be found in European print material. Uh, second, I want to elaborate a little bit on what exactly these references tell us about Singapore. Third, I want to review what purpose these references actually serve and question its use for our understanding of Singapore's past. And then I'll round up by giving, making some comments about the future of Singapore's pre-colonial past. So just to set the scene here, especially for those of you who might not be aware, Europeans had a very long presence in Asia. So between 1500 to 1800, they came to this part of the world mainly for trade. And, and over time, they waged wars, they established settlements, and at times made outright conquests. What is perhaps not so well known is that there is a, the other half to that equation. Asia was also part of Europe. And so today, historians are really talking about the connected history. And while Europe had a very physical presence here in Asia, what we are discovering is that Asia had a very material presence in Europe. So in this sense, what we're really talking about here is really the goods, exotica, the plants, animals that were shipped back to Europe, but also the knowledge of people, uh, people's places and practices. So at this point, you know, you might be asking how did Europeans actually know about Singapore uh, in this period. And I would suggest that there were actually three ways. So the first is through cartography, through maps, looking at maps, uh, globes. Of course, these were produced and sold on the market. Uh, for those who actually found employment in the trading companies or uh, descent to the East uh, for missionary work, many had the opportunity to pass Singapore by. But the large majority were able to learn about Singapore through reading about it. So this brings us to our first opener. And at this point, you might be asking what exactly 
could we read about Singapore before 1800? And were there many references to Singapore um, in this time? No. The short answer to this is yes. And what I found is that there is a very wide uh, range of works that actually refer to Singapore. So my numbers are quite tentative at this point in time, but I've looked at about 300 odd works that actually um, referenced uh, Singapore. And this is really just by exploring the variation in nomenclature. Um, and of course, some of these are found in the National Library's own collection. Uh, and uh, but others can be sourced from the public domain because many of these publications are out of copyright. So what I've done is I've tried to categorize um, these works. And just by categorizing these works it shows up quite interesting uh, permutation. So the first is I've sort of divided it according to type. And what we do find is when we divide it according to type is that there is a wide variety uh, of, of, of works that actually refer to Singapore. And some of these are familiar to historians, to researchers who have worked on them, such as travelogues, chronicles, um, sailing directions, uh, but many others are uh, but it's not limited to these as well. And there are other, other kind types of works such as religious accounts, magazines, pamphlets, uh, even uh, in fiction and in poetry. A very large category here, as you can see on the screen, is uh, what we call compendia. So these are usually summaries of knowledge at a particular point in time. And they generally provide sort of a bite-sized description uh, intended for easy reference and retrieval. Uh, and so these are what we call today dictionaries, lexicons, grammars, encyclopedias. And of course, what we do see is there were uh, many reprints into other languages as well. Um, when we divide it according to language, what we do find is there is also a widespread of works in, in the, many of the European languages. And I think it, it does show how widely knowledge about Singapore is diffused. Um, of course, many of these are in uh, in most of the major languages in Europe today. Uh, but what's also interesting is that there were uh, a large number in Latin, which was the language of the elite before the 17th century. And of course, these came to be replaced by the Romance and uh, Germanic uh, vernacular, such as Spanish, Italian, so on and so forth. Um, so categorizing these works sort of according to language also shows up some very interesting observations. So one such, one such observation I found is that references to uh, in Spanish and Italian are mostly of religious accounts. And you might also notice that there are a large number of works in English and French. So does this mean that the English and French knew a lot about Singapore? Uh, I, so my short answer to this is no, because uh, I think this number really has much to do with the digitization of works that are going on at the moment. Uh, but a closer examination at these sources revealed that the information contained therein uh, were very limited. So they were always drawn from the same set of sources. So for example, English descriptions of the Malay Peninsula and the Straits region were really heavily dependent on English travelers such as Birchers, uh, William Dampier, and Alexander Hamilton. So. Finally, I think when you look at it across time, what we do see is there was a gradual increase in a number of works that refer to Singapore. So in the 16th century, this is really confined to the Portuguese chronicles and a few religious accounts. And this starts to expand in the 17th century with the increasing number of voyages to the East, but also the development of the book trade, especially in major centers such as London, Paris, and Low countries. So in the 18th century is what, you know, some historians have actually termed there was a reading revolution. So um, of course, this is very tentative, but what we do see is that there were technical, technical innovations in publishing, the development of scientific societies, and expanding base of readership. So let me just emphasize at this point that this does not mean that new knowledge was created. In fact, what we do see is a recycling of knowledge, especially in the 18th century where collection of travel accounts such as the picture you see on the right um, became popular. And we do see narratives and accounts of plucked from different sources across various languages, regions and periods and sort of put together. And so this, even though the number of references to Singapore increased over time, but we do see this had the effect actually of recycling older knowledge for 
uh, newer readers, which actually created confusion, which I will explain later. So at this point in time, let me just say that this study is not exhaustive. I've not looked at everything, and there are definitely many more references out there. And the second point is this, you know, not all references are useful. Some really contain nothing more than a name. But uh, what, we, what I do see, what I do find is that they are generally consistent, which ties in nicely to my next section, which is what do these references actually tell us about Singapore um, in this period? So I can't really go into detail uh, into the, the interesting stories that I found, but what I want to do is sort of give you a general overview of the content of these materials. So in reading these materials, what I find is that there are four main patterns of association or tropes, uh, especially between 1500 and 1800. So one of the most common references uh, to Singapore was that it was a place of danger. And I think today we have a very different view of Singapore as a very safe place, but this was evidently not so in the early modern period. This was because sailors had to make use of the narrow waterway crossing from the Indian Ocean to the South China Sea. And what we do see sailors sort of encountering um, violent storms, you know, danger, uh, had, they had to navigate in dangerous seascapes, and there was always the potential for ambush by the local Malays. So but we do see that um, Europeans are passing this and they're sort of writing it down. And one example is from uh, the account of Domingo de Navarrete, who crossed the Singapore Straits around the mid 17th century. And he, once he made the crossing, he arrived in uh, Canton, Guangdong. And he actually talked about how the sailors were actually gossiping about um, crossing the Singapore Straits because it was, it was very dangerous. So very often, this was a place where ships often uh, faced shipwreck. And there were many attacks on Europeans around the Singapore region as well. So some of you might be familiar with the account of Jacques de Coot, who was ambushed by Orang Lao vessels of present-day Sentosa. But much less familiar is perhaps the tale of the Portuguese priest Melchior, who actually wrote to his friends in India in 1555. And he actually says, you know, this is the land of our enemies. We have killed some classic Portuguese with many tortures. Here, men are considered as lost. So I felt that this quote sort of conveys the fear that most Europeans had when they were sort of crossing uh, the Singapore region. So another common reference we do come across is reference to Singapore as place of division. And um, the Portuguese, for example, when they were writing about the Portuguese empire in Asia, they divided Portuguese Asia into different regions, in different zones. And Singapore is sort of seen as the marker between the sixth and the seventh part of Portuguese Asia. And of course, this gets picked up by later writers such as Pierre Duval. Um, of course, when we look at it as a dividing point, but it's not difficult to imagine that many of these European writers actually had a map uh, spread up before them when they're writing about it. And of course, uh, it is very natural to see Singapore's place of division, especially European sailors when they're crossing from one trading zone to another. And they were making use of the various landmarks in and around the region to navigate safely. Uh, one common reference is actually Singapore as the southernmost extremity of the Malacca Peninsula. So this is a definition that, that finds its way to many definitions of the encyclopedias and dictionaries in the 18th century. A third sort of trope is uh, really knowledge of Singapore as a Malay kingdom, so really a place of antiquity. And this does get circulated around. And of course, parts of Singapore's early history gets recorded by the Portuguese after they take Malacca. And I'm thinking here, especially of the accounts of Barosh, uh, Albuquerque. And this knowledge that was sort of recorded does circulate to humanist centers as far as Florence and Venice. And another circuit, of course, took it to France and England. Um, a very popular trope, actually, is the tale of Parmesuara's flight to Singapore and the betrayal of his host. Um, so after eight days, he, sl he slays his host and then he makes himself the lord of the straits. And this is something that you, you see often in European accounts. So they really like talking about the betrayal of uh, the, the, really, the lack of hospitality. And so in 1657, you get someone like Peter Highland, an English ecclesiastical sort of writing that Singapore is the mother of Malacca. So what you really see here is sort of Singapore's 
uh, knowledge of Singapore is tied in with the founding of Malacca as well. Finally, I think a fourth association is really Singapore as a place of concentration. So uh, over here, I've included a quote, uh, which was just written by the new governor of Manila in 1636 to the King of Spain. And he actually writes, you know, um, the Spanish must, you know, give all the neighboring people peoples to understand that your majesty is lord of all these seas except Singapore, where the Dutch keep all their forces. So this quote sort of gives us a flavor of Spanish perceptions of Singapore is really a place where the Dutch like to concentrate their forces. And of course, we know that this really happened uh, uh, just before the conquest of Malacca, Dutch ships uh, patrolled uh, the Singapore uh, region and of arguably beyond as well. Um, and you do see this reference to Singapore as a place of Dutch concentration really uh, ev evidently in Iberian accounts. Uh, but that is not all. I think we also do see Europeans sort of recording um, events that were going on uh, over time as well. So, for, uh, so what we're talking about here is really the local conflicts between uh, the local Malay powers. So for example, we do have references to um, Achenese, Achenese ships sort of gathered on, at the mouth of Singapore and also notably the, the fleet of Raja Kachu uh, gathering his Siak ships preparing to attack Johor. So what we do see here is really Singapore sort of a place of concentration. So um, just to round off this part, what we do see um, references to Singapore, they really fit into these four patterns of association. And these are easily reached and sometimes they overlap, sometimes they have, they refer to one, uh, more than one. Uh, but of course, some of you might be wondering, hey, you know, this is nothing new, you know, we've, we've read about this before, or we have had some knowledge about this. So this sort of brings us to the next section, which is uh, questioning knowledge. So what purpose do these uh, references actually serve? Um, so what I've done so far is sort of try to show that there is a significant quantity and a reasonable quality of references that refer to Singapore between 1500 and 1800. But of course, today we still think that a lot of these references, they are very sparse, they are very fragmentary, they are very contradictory. So what I want to set out in the last section is really to argue how these references can still be useful for us today. So the first is evident. Um, they provide a bridgehead for connecting Singapore's pre-colonial past with its present. So today we are talking about 700 year uh, history of Singapore. And I think the more knowledge we have of Singapore's pre-colonial past, the more we are able to add discrete episodes to the collected body of evidence. I think more importantly, uh, it's about thinking how these references can help us to understand uh, Singapore's intersection with the region in it, it inhabits. So the second point I want, to, I want to draw today sort of takes us in another direction and moving really past the uses of history into the realm of knowledge making. So if you remember Swedenham's quote, so he's sort of saying that um, there was knowledge available just that no one bothered to find out. But I think the fact of the matter is just by tracing how this knowledge uh, evolves and is accumulated over time, what we do see is how difficult it was to actually know what Singapore was. Just to give you an example here, um, in the middle column, you do see a very famous work uh, written by the Dutch. And this work actually referred to Singapore in, five, in four different ways. So it refers to Singapore as a village, a strait, a town, and a cape. And of course, this as notices and references to Singapore so start to circulate in word and print, these references start to be taken up by different scholars, and they try to reconcile. Some try to reconcile them with um, the classical knowledge. Other knowledges became decontextualized. So what you do see is by the time um, 1816 rolls around, so this is just three years before the founding of British Singapore, um, readers can still expect to find three spellings of Singapore, uh, and four definitions. And what I want to emphasize here is really that these definitions came about because we really rely on the accumulation of uh, knowledge over time, which has swelled to the point of 
of fragmentation and contradiction because they are based on a varying uh, number of uh, experience. And this is, of course, the legacy Singapore has. And it sort of explains why Singapore's history, references to Singapore are not sequenced following the internal developments of the region and its people, but have become jumbled up with realities that have little to do with its own past. So third, I think these references do help us uh, to, do help us to stake out the possibilities and the limitations of using European sources. So today, uh, for example, when we talk about Singapore sort of dividing between the East and the West, when we talk about Singapore as the southernmost point of Asia, what we really say, these are really ideas that were formed very early on in time. So this is really the legacy of European ideas. And these references really fit into the four tropes. Uh, it's very likely that the references that we find in the future will fit, fit into these four tropes. So my sort of tentative conclusion is this, the better we understand the shape of European knowledge and memory of Singapore and Straits, the more we actually realize that they must be accompanied by other perspectives that offer a different reality of its pre-colonial past. So um, just to quickly conclude, I would like to sort of finish by making uh, three small comments about the study of pre-colonial uh, Singapore based on what we've seen so far. So I think just by looking at these references, what is clear is that I've only looked at a small amount, small number of references, and there will be more references that will be found. And the second is that these references are unlikely to be substantial. So the vast majority of the references I've seen are not substantial, and it's very unlikely that we will find any more uh, substantial uh, references. Um, third, if we do find, I think they might not be immediately recognizable. And it really has a lot to do with a deeper understanding of the context in which these references were written in. So, um, of course, what I've done here is really just to put together some uh, conceptions of Singapore's past, looking at knowledge acquisition, knowledge building over time, and circulation. But I guess also, I just want to leave you with this uh, challenge in that uh, may, perhaps it is also to challenge ourselves, what are our constructs of Singapore? So um, thank you very much. This is the end of my presentation. Hope you found it interesting and that you've learned something new. And now I pass the time back to uh, Timothy. Thank you.